Joe's uh, book signing and book rollout party. Uh, it's been a long time, if ever, that we've had this many people in the museum three days after Christmas. It's wonderful to see so many new and different faces along with our regulars. So thank you for coming, supporting both Kevin and the museum. Uh, a couple uh, booky, uh, uh, business things, I guess. We have uh, Rebecca Miller, our educator, is here. Rebecca, are you in the room? She might be downstairs. Well, we'll talk about this again when Kevin is done, but Rebecca Miller, who's our educator, and she might have a volunteer or two, who would give a guided tour of the museum when we're done if you're interested. Uh, in other words, you're, there she is. Come up front, Rebecca. This is your this is your potential tour guide, Rebecca Miller. She's, she's professional. <laughs> She spends her life giving tours to school children, so if she talks down to you, you'll know why. <laughs> um, and Rita Shaw's downstairs. And Rita Shaw is one of our volunteer docents is here, too. Either one would give a really great tour. Um, and, and of course, you're free to uh, view the museum on your own if that's the way you want to do it. Uh, we're just so thrilled everyone's here. I turned down the temperature in this room. However, the heat still seems to be going up, so we're going to have to make the best of that. So, you came here to see Kevin, so let's get on with that. And an introduction, I'm, I'm going to read the notes here in the back of, about the author. Kevin O'Connor enjoys chronicling the stories of families and friends through chasing, tracing geological histories and writing. His prior writing includes a dissertation, personal letters, articles, anthologies, and presentations delivered at conferences, seminars, and webinars. He brings people together personally and professionally collaborating with friends and relatives, he plans family and class reunions. <laughs> he sings and performs in theaters and is active with Smart Ride, a bicycling group that rides annually from Miami to Key West, raising funds for HIV awareness, treatment, and education. Kevin was an elementary teacher, principal, professor, curriculum coordinator in California, Illinois, and Florida from 1973 to 2020. He authored current uh, he authored content and provided training uh, in areas including support for substitute teachers, LGBTQ advocacy, and sexual health and family life. Kevin resides in Fort Lauderdale with his husband Leon. Their family includes five sons and seven granddaughters. <laughs> that's, that's quite a mixture. <laughs> To have Kevin speak to your group or visit your book club, uh, book club contact him. He's right here. <laughs> so, Kevin, talk to us about living two floors above grief. Where's the staff people from the museum? Are some of them in the room here? There's one. They've been really a big help in the last month setting this all up. And we appreciate all everybody that, that's helped. Pull this thing off. This event has legs. It's good. So, and as I kept me informed about um, who, you know, like people who are going to be there, and I can't be that many people. And I said, I said to my cousin, I, said, I, I feel standing there. I feel like I'm in my own receiving line at my funeral. <laughs> Which ties together with the book, of course. <laughs> I, I, I hope I get this great of a turnout when I <laughs> so, But you are sitting here in a uh, museum, which in my time uh, was in my neighborhood. I'll point out the house in a second of where we are. But this, I used to play here in this neighborhood. This was Elgin Academy. They used to, I see some other east side Elgin people who might have done the same thing. But we used to be, my brother Kerry, where is he at? There he is. Um, we used to sneak in to the pool over here. They used to have an indoor pool. That was a big deal. But sometimes they left the door ajar, and you could sneak in. And, and I don't remember being in the pool. It was just a thrill to get in there. You know? Until they made that movie, um, Cocoon. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's just like the pool at, at Elgin Academy. You know, I don't, uh, you can, as you can tell, as I'm right, I don't have an agenda or things I want to talk about. But as I look at all your faces, and um, I'm looking to see if I can give you some perspective here. Um, Sandy, can you raise your hand, Sandra? Kindergarten. <laughs> kindergarten. Franklin School, you might have seen it on this slide. But we went to kindergarten together and later at St. Ed's. 
So other than my family, but there's where's Peggy Cook who introduced herself in the line? Peggy, they're okay. They lived in the neighborhood, and she said, I played with you when you were four years old. <laughs> so we've got a, a nice collection, that's not a collection, of people, <laughs> but all here, and people that I know from Elgin, from various parts of my career, uh, when I was teaching in McHenry County, and I think we got some Fremont people when I was in Mundelein. So we've got and people that, families that attended Maplewood School, and some of their kids are here. I got high school friends scattered around the room. There's college friends, again, around the room. There's just a, it's so great to have you all here, and it's very humbling to have you all here. And I'm, real, I'm elated to be here and be able to do this. From where I stand, if uh, it's a nice bright day, but if, uh, if we were to open those blinds over there. Well, we could try. I closed them because we're getting a lot of glare on the screen. Oh, okay. But it's right down the hill. So the house that I grew up in, which is the house, two floors above the grief, and it's right down, it's right down the street. One of my, uh, one of my uh, eighth grade friends here, Paul, he said I, I, I went by the house and it was really dilapidated. And I said, where were you? He, he was in a different house. <laughs> so, so I said, when you leave, just go down two blocks, and that's where it's at. So this, again, like I said, we were right here, and a number of us, I see some faces here. They used to spend the night at the funeral home, and sleepovers. We were allowed to have sleepovers, and some of you might have been a part of that. Uh, my younger friends <laughs> were there. But I just, um, this was my neighborhood. This was what, where I lived for the first 18 years of my life, and even into college. But this is where the memories start. So what I wanted to do first is take a sip of water and I borrow. Another friend came up earlier and said, you're really dry around the mouth. <laughs> but I thought I would start just by um, uh, reading a chapter, and then I'll explain this poster a little bit. But I think maybe I'm going to reverse that. I'm going to start with the poster. Because as I said to my, we had our family Christmas on Christmas Day. And as I said to my nieces and nephews and grandnieces and grandnephews and grandchildren, thanks, Alan. And I said, you know, some people say you can't tell a book by its cover. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is not one of those books. <laughs> and I'm ever grateful to the person who did this sketch of the house. Her name's Laura Sanchez. And she put that sketch together uh, for the 2009 uh, Elgin House Tour, House Swap, which happens every year, 30 years now they've been down? Over that. Over that. Okay, so when I started to think about what's the cover going to look like and working with the cover designer, she said, you have any things, uh, pictures of the house? I said, oh yeah, I think I can find some. So I contacted uh, Laura, who can't be here today. She's traveling. I wanted. I was hoping that she'd be here. But it's here. Right, this is the house. And when I talk about two floors above the grief, this was the funeral home. It looks a little, when you go when you drive by now, it's going to look a little different. This is a vintage picture, and but it probably looks pretty much like it did when my uncle Lawrence bought the property in 1939, and he'd been in town already then by 10 years, and his funeral business had grown uh, enough that he needed a bigger spot, not only for the funeral home but for the families that lived there. And so, this is a so the funeral home is on the first first floor. Two floors above the grief. <laughs> and so that, um, on the second floor, live my aunt and uncle, and there are three daughters. Some of their pictures are on the screen sometimes. And on the third floor, which was the ballroom of the original house, it was, uh, that's where Carrie and I and my brother Barrett and my mom and dad lived. And in this third floor, my, when my parents moved here in 1940 into this house, they had to make their apartment out of this big, big, big ballroom, which had two stages in it. I say in the book, and those of you that know, um, I think that's where my roots of theater come from. <laughs> and I, uh, I spent so much time on stage, even in my bedroom, that I think I could never shake it. And so uh, those of you that have joined me at the Woodstock Opera House or other places, this is part of the roots right here. Now, when the book club, uh, excuse me, when the book designer started to put things together, another basis, if you, those of you that have read it, you know that the book is based on letters that were traded between my parents, my aunt and uncle, and me, mostly between the years of um, 1968 to 75, 
But there's also some older letters in there. One I typed and wrote when I was five. There's another letter that my mom wrote to her parents the day after she was married in 1939. And so that's in there too. But all these letters have just been coming together in different places. They, uh, the family moved out of the house down here in 84. But things ended up in boxes. It's probably like it's in your family. Boxes and file folders and, you know, tucked into books and Bibles and stuff like that. So then I finally said, what am I going to do with all these letters? And so about 10 years ago, I decided to take them, and I laid them out on my floor, and I thought, what am I going to do now? So I thought I'd just put them into, I sequenced them. So I sequenced them by year, and then we got in the year. I went to month, and then I went by day, and so now they're in, uh, I might get a picture up here, and then so it scrolls through again. I have five binders of letters, all in plastic sleeves, seven to about 750 pages. So when I had all this together, I said, yeah, I think there might be a story here. I think there might be some stories here. And so what I did is I started reading through all those letters, and I started to start developing themes. And then I took some writing classes and figured out how to organize that stuff. You'll see in the background of the book that the designer, we had we'd taken some of the letters and we put them on a, a, a tabletop, and the photographer took a picture. And so what he did was then, what she did then, the designer, is put the, this picture of the letters, and then she put the, they imposed the picture of the house on top of it. So now when you look at the cover of your book, you'll see some of those letters right here. <clears throat> About a month ago, when we decided to blow up a picture of the cover uh, in this size, and we, uh, Le my husband Leon and I brought it home from FedEx, and he said, I didn't notice this arrow. What's this over here? Lo and behold, and I called the uh, I called the, the book editor, the book designer. I said, "Look what happens when you blow it up and make it this big." She says, "I didn't. That wasn't my intention, but it sure looks cool <laughs> because all these things. And now you can, now I see them in the book. But even down here, so there's letters all over. But when I first when we first looked at the cover, these things looked like clouds. And then she based the she based the color of the title." on some of the aerograms and the reds that are in the stamps. That's what she used as a color cue. And that's how she did that. But one thing that really struck us, when Leon said, what's this arrow? And what's this face in here, right here? If you look real close, there's a face. Well, the interesting thing about this, and again, the book, the book designer, she didn't know my family. She didn't know the letters. She just wanted to tie together the stories with the letters. But in this particular letter that my Aunt Meldred, and you'll hear about her in the book and read about her, my Aunt Meldred was right, she was up, she wrote me a letter, I was at school in Rome, and she wrote me a letter, and she says, you'll see the words up here, I'm crying in my beer. And then she drew an arrow to a sketch of herself that she had done, her curly hair, and then her eyelashes there, and she had a face. But the thing, and she was crying in her beer, because I had, sent, I had a, the opportunity to take a trip to Africa in December of 70. So I, my friend Greg, <laughs> he brought all the things out here. As I make connections with people, I'm getting a little, what did they say? <laughs> we don't use that word much in the Catholic <laughs> But Greg did me the favor of bringing it all out to the house, and I had sort of directions who gets what where she thought she was going to get the, um, the, the bust of this, this African woman. I still have it. It's in my shelf now in, in Fort Lauderdale. So she wrote me, and, I, and she called him the red-headed lover boy. And she said, um, well, I have to give up the red-headed lover boy, and now I, I learned that your mother gets that. But, uh, and that's what she said, I'm crying in my beer. But the interesting thing is, just the way it was laid out, this was her living room in the house. I mean, what, even if we had planned a, a book cover and said, we want that sketch coming out of the living room window on the second floor, that probably wouldn't have happened. So there she is in her living room with her face protruding out of the house. So that was another cool thing about the, the cover and putting the cover together. So I think you can tell a book by its cover. All right. So. Get a swig of water. I think I need intravenous right now. <laughs> Mary Camacho, can I borrow your book? 
They were on College Street, right down here. <laughs> and first block. First block. So they grew up just down the street from us. She and her, her three siblings. And when that when we had this tour here, and now the house had been owned by another family, it's still owned by the Leeds family, but they had it on the tour. And so we're going on the tour, and we walk up to our third floor. And this area, this was my bedroom. This was my mom and dad's bedroom. And there's another room in the back. We called it the back room. And, it, and the new owners have made that into their bedroom. So my mom's in a walker, and we got her up the stairs. And we're walking back, and there's Mary Camacho. She's the docent. <laughs> so she's telling other people, you know, about the family who used to live here. And then we walked in. But she says she's known our family for years. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a chapter here uh, and read. Because I think this particular chapter pulls the book together a little bit. Uh, and in the last chapters of the book, who, who in here watched Six Feet Under? Okay. And if you call it Six Feet Under, the last few episodes, can you hear me okay even though my mic's down here? Uh, the last few, they, in Six Feet Under, they took the main characters, and they, okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> find a ship. I should have, the teacher in me says, Kevin, you should have bookmarked this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So anyway, um, so in the last few chapters, I tell the stories, just like they did in Six Feet Under, I got it. Just like they did in Six Feet Under, about the, how the people died. And I start this chapter by saying, um, so there was five, five people on the second floor, five on the third floor. And so I start the chapter by a quote um, from my aunt, Aunt Lillian. In their family, when her brother died, her brother Dan, she wrote me in Romans, she said, uh, you know, people are supposed to die in the order of their birth. <laughs> but she said, my brother Dan did things differently. He was a third born. He did things differently. And she said, needless to say, the rest of us are all looking at each other furtively. <laughs> so I said in the book, Carrie and Bear and I are looking at each other furtively. <laughs> but, and Barrett's not with us today. Carrie is. Some of Barrett's kids are here. And um, Barrett wasn't able to come from Arizona. But I want to read this chapter because this is the chapter I wrote about mom. And it incorporates a lot of what's in the book. So if you just... I'm going to read aloud to you a little bit. This is Mary Helen Serralo O'Connor. Died October 1st, 2010. The prologue of this book opened with the story of Mom's last hours. There was more of the story of her final years and her funeral and services in Elgin. I was with Mom at her Huntley home during the spring of 2007. Her arm was in a cast from a fall. She wanted to take a shower. I moved with her as she maneuvered her walker into the bathroom. Although the shower area was handicap equipped, she told me she was not steady in her feet enough to get into the shower. Darn, I really want to take a shower. What can I do? Well, Mom, how about if I use a warm washcloth and give you a sponge bath? Oh, I want to get my hair wet and get a shampoo. I'm sure some of you have had that feeling, too. Okay, Mom, here's an idea. I'll get you undressed. But in order to keep you steady, I will get in the shower with you. Mm, oh, oh, oh. I'm not sure about that, she said. <laughs> I said to her, would you feel more comfortable if I kept my briefs on? <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you sure you're okay with that? Oh, Mom, do you mean you'd be okay with my briefs off? <laughs> and she smiled. She said, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And she left. Let's do it. I positioned her on a stool in the shower. I assisted her in taking off her clothes. I helped her to hold on to the handicap bar on the wall of the shower area. Mom, I don't want you to peek, but I'm going to take off my clothes except for my briefs, and I'm going to stand right here next to you. Okay, you know, this is something we've never done before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mom, a new adventure. I turned on the faucet and adjusted the temperature while the water flowed through Mom's hands. You know, hey, Mom, tell me when the temperature is right for you. <sighs> okay, that's good. So I wet her hair, massaged her scalp with the shampoo, and then I rin rinsed her hair. Oh, that feels good. I'm so glad. I continued with washing and rinsing her body. Time to get out. I'm going to turn off the water now. I wrapped towels around her shoulders and across her lap. 
I dabbed the towels until her skin dried. I helped her steady her stand briefly while I removed the tool. Stool, soon I could with the stool. <laughs> you can play with that sentence in my hand. I removed the stool from underneath her and repositioned it and the, uh, on the floor in front of the counter and mirror. I helped her to move from the shower area to the stool. Then I replaced the towels. Hey, time to dry your hair. I'll get the dryer. I'll put the dryer in one hand and a brush in the other. I stood behind her to keep her from falling. How do you want me to comb your hair? I asked. Oh, I can do that by myself. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. I can do that by myself. I don't need you for that. You hold the dryer. I will brush my hair. By the time the hair was dried and brushed, her body was dry too. Mom, hold on to the stool. I'll get the clothes for you. I expeditiously went to her drawer and closets. I returned with clean undergarments, pants, and a blouse. I helped her get dressed. We went back to the living room. Oh, I feel so much better, she said. I'm glad you're comfortable with this. I'll be glad to do it again. Oh, that would be nice. And the scene was replicated in the months that followed. After retiring, as I pause, take a breath, some water. Thank you. All right. After retiring as principal from Maplewood, who's here from Maplewood? Yeah. And Carey School District? All right. Uh -huh. After retiring as principal from Maplewood School in Cary in June 2007, I moved to Hollywood, Florida. Mom was living in Naples each year from October through May and in Elgin from May through October. Hollywood is a 90-minute drive from Naples. I welcome this privilege and opportunity to be with her two to three times a week to provide respite for her caregivers. In the summer of 2009, we hired Amy as mom's caregiver in Elgin. Amy then moved with mom to Naples after the 2009 Christmas holidays. In the summer of 2010, Barrett, Carey, and I agreed to move mom and Amy to Hollandale Beach near Hollywood so I could be more readily available for her. Leon's my husband's daughter-in-law, Orly, a real estate agent, found an apartment on the 18th floor of a building overlooking the Atlantic. Mom was so happy to be living with a view of the water. I've always wanted to live on the water. Now here I am, she said proudly. I spent my times with mom in conversation, reading aloud to her from letters and newspapers, playing cards and rummy cube. I spoke to either Carrie or Barrett on a near daily basis. Now mom was a voracious reader. In her last few years, she lost the ability to read comfortably and pay attention. It was difficult for her to hold a book or a newspaper. Well, I suggested I read the letters referenced and shared in this book. She agreed. The letters provided a sense of history for me and mom. Sitting on her terrace overlooking the Atlantic the month before she died, I read aloud one of my letters written to Dad and her in September 1970. Quote, Dad and Mom, thank you so much for writing to tell me you will save my letters. Someday, we will be able to read these letters and remember what we were doing and the adventures we had. Wow, a revelatory and predictive comment. I felt a chill when I read those sentences aloud to Mom on the terrace. I looked at her and she smiled. I caught a tear in her eye. Isn't that amazing, she said. Here we are, 40 years later. What you said would be happening is happening. Now, 50 years later, I use the content of these saved letters to share stories about grandparents, parents, and relatives. The personalities of our family come to life through the stories of those letters. Also, she liked to read herself to sleep. One time while I was putting her to bed, she lamented, Ugh, oh, I wish I could still read in bed. Well, Mom, how about if I read from one of your novels sitting here on the table? Well, that would be nice. It's been a long time since someone has read out loud to me from a book. Well, I picked up the romance novel that appeared, be, <laughs> that appeared to be the most current from her bedside. I opened to a bookmark. Hmm. He stroked her along the top of her shoulder. He gently touched between her breasts. Mom said nothing. I, continu I continued. He reached one finger to her protruding nipples as he gazed into her eyes. Mm, she said, I don't recall that part. <laughs> I said to her the question, keep going, I asked, gauging her comfort level. Sure. <laughs> she said, we've come this far in our lives, you got it. What's a few more words like this between us at this point? I continued. She fell asleep. She did not ask me again to read from her letters. 
Barrett visited her in Hollandale the week before she died. Barrett and I talked about Facebook as we looked at laptop screens. Mom inquired, what are you doing? Barrett explained to her about Facebook. How do I do it? Well, so Barrett and I set up a Facebook account for her. A few, days, a few days later, I sat with her on the couch with my computer open to her Facebook page. By now, she had a number of followers making comments to her. Oh, I'm so confused about this stuff. This Facebook thing, how does it happen? Why is my picture on there? <laughs> well, Mom, Facebook is like writing a letter or making a phone call to someone, I replied. You can write to someone on Facebook. You can see what they have been doing by looking at the pictures and comments they write. People write comments back to them. It's like a conversation. Well, on Tuesday, September 28th, Amy called our character, her caregiver at 1.45 in the afternoon to tell me she had called 911. I arrived at the driveway of the condo building as paramedics lifted Mom aboard the ambulance. I followed the ambulance to add them to our hospital. Mom was taken to the emergency room, examined, and moved to the cardiac care unit. I experienced a series of serendipitous events in the following days. The first thing I noticed upon entering Mom's room was an Elgin clock hanging on the wall. Hmm. It was not common to see Elgin wall clocks in 2010. When Mom was sleeping, I looked at the clocks in each of the 30 rooms in that particular unit. I counted three Elgin clocks. What were the chances Mom was randomly placed in one of the rooms with an Elgin clock? Serendipity. I'm wearing an Elgin watch right now. It was given to me by my mom's father. Mom zapped intermittently. She woke wide-eyed, wide, wide eyed from asleep, and blurted, and she blurted out, Facebook, Facebook. <laughs> Somehow, in her oxygen-induced sleeping, she was coming to an understanding of social networking. <laughs> she was updating her contact list or putting a post on her wall. Not knowing or ready to accept what was happening during her hospital stay, I perceived that Mom, in her sleep, was reinitializing direct connections with Dad and others who were reaching out to her. She was in the ultimate social network. <laughs> Mom exhibited an accepting outlook on her death. She remarked to me she was ready. She said this in a matter-of-fact, not sad way. She kept her sense of humor, always. <sighs> she woke the next morning, opened her eyes, looked at me, and smiled. Oh, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mom, where'd you think you'd be? <laughs> well, you know, I thought it might be my time. Well, not now. Let's have some breakfast. <sighs> the following morning, the doctors informed me of Mom's deteriorating condition. I met with the nurse in charge of the hospice wing of the hospital. She introduced herself as Catherine, but her name tag was printed Margaret C. I asked why. Well, Margaret is my given legal name, but I go by Catherine. Mom's deceased sister's name was Margaret, another sign of serendipity. Thursday morning, Carrie made plans to fly to Miami. The doctor recommended Mom stay in oxygen prior to moving her to hospice. The doctor wanted to be sure Carrie arrived to spend time with her. It was serendipity that this empathetic doctor was assigned to her case. Barrett called to remind me, hey, hey, did you contact a priest? I hadn't. Um, <laughs> I met with the front desk nurse. She contacted a priest from nearby St. Lawrence Church. Now, in Catholic traditions, St. Lawrence does not rank among the top names assigned to Catholic parishes. Another St. Lawrence parish, located right here in Elgin, also Mom's brother-in-law, Lawrence, was a significant person in her life. What were the chances that a priest be coming from St. Lawrence Parish in Hollandale Beach, Florida? I told Mom the priest was coming from St. Lawrence Parish to give her the last rites. She grinned and she said, Lawrence? <coughs> An hour later, the priest arrived. Mom and I looked at his name tag. My eyes filled with a tear or two. The name on the name tag? William. Mom looked at the name tag. His name is Billy, my, father, my father's name. She whispered one of her commonly used conversational phrases. Heavenly days through her oxygen mask. At that moment, I think there was connection attached to heavenly in that phrase. Mom smiled at the coincidence of the priest's name, serendipity. Carrie arrived at the hospital at 8 p.m. after Father Bill had departed. Carrie took some time alone with Mom, followed by conversation with Mom, Carrie, Leon, Amy, and me. Mom was starting to fade. Two hours later, the nurse came in. 
Mrs. O'Connor, are you ready? Yes, I am. We stayed with Mom as the nurse disconnected the devices attached to her. She stayed alert and talked a bit. We all accompanied the nurse and attendants as they wheeled her bed through the halls of the hospital to the hospice area where the attendant, Millicent, introduced herself. We all looked at her and each other. You can't get much closer to the name Mildred, my aunt, than the name Millicent. Again, serendipity. Millicent took her, her, took her into an available room, gave her a sponge bath, and placed her into bed. We came into her room and sat on the sides. It took just a few minutes for her to make her transition. Mom died a few minutes past midnight on October 1st. This date was significant to her bookkeeper skills because that date is the beginning of the fourth quarter and the start of a new month. <laughs> Mom earned her full Social Security check for October by living to the first 20 minutes of the first day of the month. <laughs> to her last breath, she, atten she obtained the balance checkbook and up-to-date financial records she regularly accomplished to the penny serendipity. Mom died far from Meldrum. She was assigned. Let me turn the page there. I think I had this memorized for now. She was assigned to a room with an Elgin clock, representing her parents and her Elgin upbringing, a hospice intake person with the name of her sister Margaret, a priest named Bill from St. Lawrence Parish, and a hospital greeter with the name closely uh, hospice greeter closely akin to Mildred's name. This was ultimate serendipity. A strong connection to the key players in our lives from Division Street. <coughs> Carrie and I knew Mom was home. In designing the program cover for the funeral, my niece Kelly found a picture of Mom she thought to be the right one. This particular picture of Mom was taken 15 years earlier when she exited St. Mary's Church arm in arm with her sister Margaret. Was it uncanny for Kelly to choose a picture of Mom taken in St. Mary's, the church where she was baptized, married, and attended Mass regularly? It wasn't uncanny. It was serendipity. Carrie stayed in Hollywood for three days. We continued as sons of undertakers. Carrie made arrangements for us to be on the same flight to Chicago as Mom's coffin. We boarded the plane and watched through the window as, the, as her coffin was loaded in the baggage area. When we landed in Chicago, we exited the plane and watched from the terminal window as her transport coffin exited the plane and was placed on a cart pulled by a golf cart. So appropriate for Mom's coffin to be broke, pulled by a golf cart. Mom played golf at least weekly in her lifetime. The cart drove to meet the hearse. We met the hearse in the cargo area and rode with Mom from O'Hare back to O'Connor Leach's funeral home, right down the street, in Elgin. We met with the rest of the family later in the day to make arrangements with Lucy, the employee assigned to our case. Mom's body was placed in one of the original funeral parlors. The wooden sliding doors dividing the parlor from the front vestibule and stairway were left open. Many of those who came to the wake took up positions on couches and chairs at the bottom of the stairs leading up to our apartments. Some people sat on the stairs for their conversations. This was home to all of us. At the conclusion of the wake, we went out to eat like we had done for all our earlier family wakes. Next morning, we arrived at the service at the funeral home. We decided to bury Mom with her gold bracelet with charms attached representing various milestones in her life. I wish we had not buried her with it. <laughs> the charms might have been shared with individuals in the family as remembrance of her. Ah, it's too late now. Barring an exhuming of her body, Mom is keeping that bracelet. <laughs> Mom's nieces and nephews and Leon, Leon served as pallbearers. As they exited the front door of the funeral home and placed Mom's closed coffin in the hearse, Carrie and Bear and I traded quick, knowing glances. We stepped quickly to the front of the hearse, placed ourselves behind the wheel, and drove in the procession to escort Mom's body four blocks away to St. Mary's. After the service, we continued the drive to Mount Hope Cemetery for the graveside services. Mom, Mildred, Lawrence, and Dad were now together in a shared cemetery plot under a tombstone purchased almost 40 years prior when Mildred passed away. The four of them together, as they were on Division Street. At the conclusion of the graveside prayers, a vibrant, interactive atmosphere occurred at her graveside. There was no rush to get into cars. It felt like a cocktail party without the alcohol. Well, I, I think maybe some people did have one. <laughs> people milled about from one conversation to the next. Suddenly, a family friend who owned a funeral home in Elgin mentioned to Carrie, You know, I think your mom's coffin is in the wrong direction. 
as it is now, her feet will be next to your dad's head. <laughs> Thank goodness for the trained eye of an undertaker. We summoned the pallbearers to let them, some who are in this room right now, we summoned, the, <laughs> we summoned the pallbearers to let them know their job was being continued. Amidst laughter of all those learning what was happening, the pallbearers turned mom's coffin and repositioned the head of her coffin to, the, to be level with dad's. All my days work for an undertaker. It makes me wonder how many coffins do go down in the ground. <laughs> Mom was in the care of so many right up to the very end. And now she and Dad are reclined side by side, head to head. A lot of you here knew my mother, Either, and some of you, as I look at you, you knew her as rather a younger person. You might have played cards with her, you might have done things, and some of the stories in there, I try, I try to relate not only to my interactions with them, but also to make connections with some of you in the room. I said to my grand, my kids yesterday on Christmas Day, as I was, I was, I was doing like a Music Man pitch, a uh, Harold Hill pitch to them a little bit, saying, all right, I wrote this book for you, but not only for you, but I know this book can connect a lot to families, and Spook can connect to a lot of families. Not if, It doesn't have to be a funeral home family. It doesn't have to be a family that, a St. Ed family, or a Loyola family, or all the a St. Mary family, all the other associations, or maple with any one of those connections. But uh, I said this book, my, when, they, when you start to write, those of you who have written, they want you to say, choose your audience. So I said, okay, I'm writing this for my family. I'm, this is my main audience. But as I got into the writing, then I decided this has more potential and I wanted to make it more generic. So that's a little bit of the one chapter. There's many more in there. I'm glad to see a lot of books in your hand. At some point, our photographer is going to take a picture of all of us with you holding your books up there. But um, at this point, who has any thoughts, comments, questions? Sue? Where is the barn? Ah. Okay. Who here from El? Who here? Who here from El? Who here from Elgin has been in the barn? Hey. Hi. Okay. There's a story in there. Behind the house, so down here, when Dad and Uncle Lawrence bought it in uh, 1939, the house has a history. It was built in 1886, and it had gone through a few owners. But this this area of Elgin was really farmland. And it was a lot of cows were here, and the Borden family was very big at that time because they had uh, created condensed milk. So a lot of the farming that was going on here had to do with cattle and cows. So um, we think that the barn was built before the house. There was a house next door to uh, the house that's still there that was built before the house. So the, the Borden family lived in that house, and then part of their family wanted to build this house. So if you go to dairy history, <laughs> That, that's part of how it connects. So there was a barn on the property. The other thing that happens in funeral home families is that it's difficult to plan a party. It's not difficult to even plan the party, but you always run the chance, what if we have a funeral? What if we have a wedding? Do we tell everybody to go home? What do we do? Our family got a, 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 used to the idea of planning those events on a Saturday. It's not likely that there's going to be a wake on a Saturday night or even on a Sunday. You need Sunday night, you have to stay away from that a little bit sometimes. So the family for graduations or weddings or whatever would gather in the two apartments. And we could have 100, 150 people. My dad's family was big. My mom's family is big. Um, so we could have people going up and down the stairs. There's two kitchens. You'd sit on the stairs. I don't know where they put the bar. There was always a piano or two that was playing. And you, people would go up and down the stairs to do their socializing. But it just got to be a little difficult to keep that up. So dad and Lawrence had this idea. What if we take the barn and make it into a, a celebration area? So the barn in the, its original times was what you would think as a barn. It had a big sliding doors, and Barrett tells us stories about how he used to park his bike there. They also parked the farming equipment there. Not farming, the funeral equipment there. We weren't farmers. We were funeral. Uh, so they parked their equipment there. And so they worked on a way with contractors to uh, make the barn into an open space. And so we, as a family and as kids, we had uh, parties out there. Uh, as, as I explained in the book, it was a nice place for us to go. We had a little yard out there. Something we didn't have as undertaking families 
in the up in the two floors above the funeral home. So the, so the barn is still there. It's now been converted into I think a single family home, but the, it's probably was built in the 1850s or so. But it served purposes with us for our, for our entertainment and for things to do and to sing and dance and drink and things like that. So we had a lot of. I know a lot of you have your own stories about the barn. So well, that's where what, was it in relationship uh, okay, to thanks, the house? So, okay, thanks. Okay, good question. I could pick some people here to do it, but I. It, what behind here? Okay, this is this. This is how you drive. This is how you drove around the side of the house. Behind this, there's a way to get to the barn. And drive, driving around this way or this way. It's, it was. It was footsteps. It wasn't. Oh, it was footsteps. No, no. We, we didn't. We didn't need to get a car. <laughs> it was. It was footsteps. And so when even when mom and dad wanted to uh, have a barbecue, they go out there in summers. Carrie and I and their other family would join them in the backyard where you had picnic tables and things like that. So it was it was a, it was walking and there was also a phone in the barn that you could be that many you know, if, if somebody was calling to have services or to say somebody had died or they needed an ambulance, you could pick up the phone in the barn and, and, and heed, heed the call. So that was what the barn was. Thanks for the question. Other things about about the book. About your own things of Elgin or your own families, anything that you. Yes, Annette. How did your um, parents get into the funeral home? Okay, Annette, my colleague from Cary, <laughs> asked how did our family get into it? Okay. My uncle Lawrence, who was born in 1905, and they lived, the family originated in Hammond, Indiana. And my uncle Lawrence, uh, I don't know, he, he worked as a, as a employee of a place called Burns Funeral Home. And you still see, I mean, you know, in that part of Indiana, you still see that name attached to funeral homes. So he worked there, but then 1930, 1929, he, got, he wanted to have his own business. And he was getting married, too, in 1930. So that's where Mildred comes in. He convinced her, I think, whatever I say in the book, that when you're married, getting married in 1930, the woman, the, the wife doesn't have a lot of say. She loved Lawrence. He wanted to start a funeral home. He looked at possibilities in the Gary in Northwest Indiana, and there wasn't anything there. He heard through Mr. Burns. He said, um, hey, Larry, I know you want to be an undertaker. I heard that there's there might be a chance for you in Elgin, Illinois. Uncle Lawrence, where's Elgin? I mean, think about pre-interstate, the distance between Hammond and Indiana and, and Elgin, Illinois. He said, yeah, they've lost two undertakers in that town just recently, and two of them catered to the Catholic faith. And they need a, a young guy like you to come and start a funeral home and, and be a Catholic undertaker. So their first business was on Villa Street. I took a picture, it might be in these pictures up here. There's a, it's still there, it's next to Turner Hall in Elgin, that was 18 Villa, and they moved there, not only with newlyweds, three days after they're married in June, they brought my dad with them. He was 16, ready to go to his junior year. And my aunt, Lanny's mother, and they came, they were both teenagers, and their grandparents. So I say in the book, picture a young bride, <laughs> Mildred, marrying into a family that says, I got this great idea. We're gonna move to Elgin, Illinois. Elgin, and we're gonna start a funeral home in an old house. Oh, okay. And my mom, my mom and dad are coming with me. My mom and dad, oh, I didn't tell you the rest. We have to take my younger brother and my younger sister with us. So that's how they started. They came to Elgin, and then they worked. This, I tell stories in there about how they did their marketing and how they worked to build up the funeral home. And then when the build up, when the funeral home grew, because in that little house on Villa Street, Mildred and Lawrence had three daughters. And there was lots of kids running around. The grandparents were there. My dad and my aunt uh, Lillian were there. It was getting a little crowded. So uh, Lawrence found this house. And in the book, there's a whole story about what he had to go through to get the house. It, it was, it's, it's a little piece of Elgin history. So that's how we started. Now, the funeral home is still there. It's still the funeral home. And now it says O'Connor Leeds Funeral Home. So the business with the O'Connor name has been in town for 92 years now. 92 years. So. So we have that. Thanks for that question. Other insights, questions, anything anybody wants to add or say? Hey, Deanna, cousin Deanna. 
Well, I'm a cousin of Kevin. <laughs> My mother and Kevin's mother were sisters. Oh. So anyway, when I was, my mother and dad moved up into Burlington Central School District when I was going to be a senior. And I had gone to school with all my classmates for many years. So consequently, I, I wanted to um, go still stay with them. So I lived at the funeral home. So I lived in, in the room where there was a stage. There was a <laughs> stage in the room. And Kevin and Carrie's beds slid right under the stage. I'll never forget that. But I slept in the room out by where the bathroom was and the laundry. So many days I woke up and there were sheets and things hanging all over the place. And I don't think Mary didn't have a dryer at that. We didn't have a dryer. So anyway, we we I stayed there for the whole, the whole nine months of my school year, and I enjoyed living there. And there had a lot and lot of funny tales to tell. It really was. So it was. It was, great. It, it was a very multi-generational house. At one point, Mildred's mother lived with us. So um, so she, she came to live with us. So we had Grandma Cruzanne there on the second floor with the three daughters, and Barry and Carrie and I, and then Deanna comes in, and, well, we'll make room for you two. But uh, we still tease Deanna about, Deanna, what was it like to wake up and see Mom's bra hanging above you? <laughs> we didn't have any, we didn't have any uh, dryer at the time. So the, the clotheslines were where... Yeah, well, that was part, sometime, years later, that was Barrett's bedroom, too. That's so, right. yeah, so, thanks, thanks for that insight. <laughs> other other thoughts, questions, ideas? Hey, yeah, Jeannie. I don't know why I don't know this. Did any of your siblings get into the funeral business at all? How, how did you guys met? <laughs> <laughs> well, um... Maybe because <laughs> no, and uh, you could go. Uh, and Carrie and I have shared stories, and we've done this. And we come from a family of undertakers. I got my cousin Bob Allenson here, sitting next to his sister Lanny Allenson. Oh, their okay. their their mother is my dad's sister. Okay. So their mother started romancing with Bob Allenson the owner of the funeral home down the street. So out of dad's six siblings, dad had six siblings, two sisters, four brothers. Um, um, Lawrence, dad, her brother Ed, were all undertakers. He, Ed was an undertaker in Chicago. And then Lillian, Aunt Lillian, goes up and marries another undertaker. So, so out of the four siblings, uh, six siblings, four of them were involved in the funeral home industry. So back to your question, Jane. Dan and uh, Uncle Lawrence um, never put that on us, that we have to continue the business. That I never remember them approaching me about it, and I think uh, Carrie and Barrett might agree. Um, and that we just, there was, there was, we knew that the business was there. We knew if we wanted to do it, we could. I've read some other literature lately that says that a lot of times undertaking families, we think they might go many generations, but sometimes they don't. We were one of the ones that didn't. And we just made our own decisions. I say in the book that I think, though, I got involved in education because from 1953 to about 1969, so Carrie, 53, Carrie and I were just coming out of diapers. So we were little kids. The first cousin, the first second cousin, was born in 1953. And then after the next 16 years, 20 more babies were born in, in the house. 1966, any woman in our house of childbearing age had a baby. <laughs> we, we called them the 1966 cousins. And um, so, but any, at any given time, there were cribs in different bedrooms and rearranging. You, know, you can't sleep there, that baby's in there. But I, I learned at a young age, you know, how to change a diaper, how to put a, a bottle in water, how to rock, how to, to play games and get them calmed down. And I really think, that's, in my own mind, as I learned about child development, that's what led me to my own career. And it was, became never a question to, to be uh, an undertaker. Uh, Kerry has similar stories about how he found his avocations. And my brother, Barrett, was a banker in town. So each of us found our own way to um, find our careers. And Dad and Mom and Uncle Lawrence never once said to us, you know, you got this great business here, why don't you do it? This is the reverse. You guys go out and find what you want to do. You discover your own life. And so we always had that 
that freedom and my three cousins, older cousins. At that time, um, my oldest cousin was, they were all born in the 30s. So at that time, you didn't really think of a woman being an undertaker. So they, when they graduated from St. Ed's and went on to college, they found their own lives. But I probably, I don't know for sure, but I don't think anybody ever came to them. Hey, why don't you, why don't you work the business? They didn't do that because I think they went off and moved to different places in different states. So I, 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 I treasured that my parents gave us that freedom to make our own decisions, what we wanted to do. So thanks for the question, Jean. Yes? I don't know how many people know about Clarence Reaver involved in this yes. building and the, in business. He had an office up on the third floor for many years when the third floor wasn't even finished. Mm -hmm. And there is a plaque that I saw that. Harry Blizzard yeah, created. But that's, it's right here. We have a long term. Clarence Reaver is, uh, was an undertaker in town that was here when Uncle Lawrence moved, first moved. And, and he became a major history person. I saw the plaque and I said to Al, where's Al? I said to Al, is that Clarence Reaver? He said, yeah, the Reaver, the Reaver room. I suppose we can get, I suppose we can get an O'Connor room in here someplace? <laughs> <laughs> no. um, thanks for that question, that little bit of history. Uh, other thoughts and stuff? Let me explain a little bit. So that those of you that got here a little later, we, did, we ran out of books. And so, doesn't mean, doesn't mean you can't get one, but, uh, but we ran out of books. So um, that'll be less to take back with us to Florida when we have our five o'clock flight. But actually we tried to order more, but in the Amazon world, um, and with the way the shipping is going right now, we couldn't get them until January. So if, if you're in that position, Leon, my husband, business manager, salesperson, uh, he's, he can set you up with an alternative way to buy a book, and that would be through Amazon. You can go to a bookstore and order it. Right now it's not on bookstore shelves, but if you go to a Barnes & Noble or an independent bookstore to say, I want this book, uh, they will look it up and order it for you. So in these envelopes, for those of you um, that are in that situation, I appreciate you purchasing. But in these envelopes, I have a, a plate. A little, it's actually really also known as a name tag. But I just wrote the same thing I wrote in all your books. It's right here. You can just put it right in there. Also, I have a sticker that goes inside the book. Some, most of your books have these stickers. I've got more. I'd appreciate it. If you don't have one inside the front cover, I'll give you one. This is a QR code that takes you right to um, the uh, Amazon review site. In the Amazon world, those of you that are Amazon readers, the, um, a major part of a book selling or book marketing is to have people make reviews on Amazon. So once you read the book, even if you just read chapter one, if you want, just go ahead and leave a review. But this will take this QR code will take you right there. If you don't have them, I got plenty up here, and that makes it convenient for you. To, to go ahead and go to Amazon. I learned Amazon Amazon is, um, they do their books on demand. So a friend of mine, Jack Hubbard, who a lot of us know, he said to me a couple months ago, how many books do you have to order? Because Jack has published a book himself. And he, he said, um, don't order too many because they're hard to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, I just got rid of them. And he was able to distribute them to classes he teaches. What I learned about Amazon, though, is when you press, press your order, it's on demand. So whatever in some magic Amazon place, they, I picture Gutenberg, you know, going like this. You gotta print another one, you gotta print another one. Getting the printing press going. But um, he, that's, so that's when you order your book from Amazon. And I look today, if you were to order on Amazon today, you'd have it by Friday. So, so they have a good turnaround, that kind of stuff. So that's that. Oh, it's this. You have Kathy. Kathy, what you have? It is on Kindle. It's on Kindle. It's on Kindle, so you can get there. And when you, if you wanted somebody to call me the other day, I want my mom to have, be able to read it on her iPad. I think you just order a Kindle book and then it transfers to her iPad. And then we're supposed to do, um, after the first of the year, supposed to ring, um, it hasn't all come together yet, but then we'll do the audio version. So that'll be another version. That's something. So. Are you doing the audio? Okay. 
I, I have to say. Yeah. You should. Have. You think I should? Okay. Yeah. I did. I did listen to Colin Jost on uh, his book, Colin Jost from Saturday Night Live, and it was it was good to hear his voice. And I thought, well, maybe I could pull that off. I don't know. I'll have to ask him. I, I have to go to the people that are helping me market the book and say, eh. Your, your voice maybe is not what we want. I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll follow their lead. I'll follow their lead. But thanks for that question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, Ted. Did you, uh, before, did you have your family edit or review some of the stories? Because you saw the letters, they saw the letters too, I'm sure. But you had interpretations and memories that Barrett might have said, oh, no. Wait a minute. I mean, did you actually have any other kind of family interaction that altered the way that you wrote initially? I've learned through this process never to make assumptions. <laughs> because although, I mean, I would send my book, send drafts, word, uh, word documents, you know, thick paper, put them in the mail, or have, if they knew how to download it, they would do that. And so I had my brother Barrett. I sent Barrett a copy. I sent Carrie copies. I have a cousin named uh, Bill Osborne, who's 92. He was married to my uh, cousin, Maureen. He lives in Kansas. He read it a couple of times. We have another cousin, uh, Sister Michelle Dermody, who's our cousin. She would read through it, and, I, and then she would share it with her brother, Ron. And then I would say, okay, did I get this part right? And or, is this okay? I sat down in the initial stages. One of the things I learned in writing class, in choosing your audience, uh, my, uh, my counselor, said, pick one person in your family to talk to about the book and what they want to know. So I chose my, one of my oldest cousins, oldest, she'll be 70 this year, Kathy, Kathy Osborne Paulson, and I said, I'm going to have an interview with you. She says, is this going to be okay? It's fine, it's fine. So we interviewed her. Just to say, I had some questions to say, what would you like to see in the book about your grandpa and your grandma? What do you like to know? And one of the things she said to me, she says, uh, her grandma died when she was a senior in high school. No, her. She said, you know, I really, I'm almost 70 now. I don't know a lot about my grandmother. And she's the oldest of that group of cousins who are now down into their 50s. So as the, those cousins have read the book, and now they're starting to read, they're starting to see, learn a little bit more about our grandmother. I have been staying with Carrie Linda this week, and uh, Carrie will say, was that in the book? I haven't had a chance to read that part yet. Ah, I hope when you get to that part, it's okay with you. <laughs> so, so, uh, 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 well, I, I, there's an audience there. That's what I did tend to try to hear other voices. And I, I think I'm hearing more voices than I supposed to. But, but I, wanted to make, I wanted to make sure that I wanted to be true. And I could uh, tell the story and make make up stuff. <laughs> but um, but I wasn't. I didn't want to do that because I. Um, that's for another kind of book. But I didn't want to do that. So, other thought. Yeah. Write another book. Write another book. Yeah, it's in my blood now. It's in my blood, I th and and uh, Leanne's a great support and uh, lets me have my has my time, and we have our own schedule, and I fit the writing part into it. I've been really busy now with the marketing. I've learned that marketing a book is not uh, unsimilar to marketing a school. <laughs> As a school principal, uh, educator, those of us from Maplewood uh, and and other schools where I've taught it. You have to you have to have that persona that out there, and as, as a teacher, you have to market yourself and your product to your parents and your classrooms. So it's really the same. And so I thought I, when I first started, I know I'm doing it. Then I said, Kevin, you know what you're doing. You've done it for forty some years in, as an educator. So that is is how. And I don't even know what was your question. <laughs> Oh, right. <laughs> These people have worked with me for 18 years. <laughs> they probably feel like they're at another faculty meeting. <laughs> so, yes, 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 everything. Kumbaya. But, um, so yeah, I have a couple ideas in mind. I think um, there's enough stories in, in this book process they teach you just to write until you can't stop. And so I wrote for, uh, sort of like Forrest Gump. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. And I got, um, I was up to 145,000 words. And my, the people that work with me, 
you know, a memoir or a book of that has to be about 80,000 words, eh, maybe 85. You want it to be, people don't want to read 144,000 words. And you want your book maybe to be on a bookshelf in a store or an airport. That's too many words. So uh, my first editor, his job, and I didn't know him. I hired him uh, via online. His name's Patrick Price. He lives in Ber Berkeley. I said, Patrick, here's what I want you to do. You have to figure out a way to get rid of a lot of this stuff. And they, in uh, Stephen King calls it killing your babies because you write all this stuff and then you have to edit and you have to figure out what to get rid of. Fortunately, I hired somebody who was outside of Elgin, outside of the family realm, and he, after his, um, he took about six weeks and he says, I think I got something here. I cut out this and this and this and this. He said, but you, maybe you can use that for another book or you can use it on your website, kevinoconnorauthor.com, or you can use it on your <laughs> website uh, or just other stories. So I'd like to maybe pursue that. Also, having worked in the education field for a long, long time, there's some educational stuff. Even though I've been out of it for 20 years, I, I still... <laughs> one of my earlier writing skills in another part of my life, those of you, I wrote a weekly bulletin, not only to the parents, but I wrote it to the staff. So I have, and people, uh, Christy, Christy uh, Wagner over there, I think you might have been the one that said to me, I wrote a story once to the parents saying what I was feeling when I was taking down my kid's swing set because they had reached the time of not being, uh, being using it. So I took it down and I, it might have been Christy or another Maplewood parent said, yeah, I really like that. I can really relate to that. So on my shelf next to the fort binders, I still have all the bulletins. <laughs> and, all, and, and I'm thinking there's a way, maybe there's a way to put those together and maybe reach out to current educators and tell them this is what you don't do. Or <laughs> say, the, or the, maybe talk about the continuity of our profession. And so that's one book I have in mind. And then the other thing I have in mind, as long as I've got the mic, is <laughs> one more story. We had a superintendent named Tim Kelly, who, uh, and he, you know, superintendents are when you start whatever period of your work you're doing, and you may remember the time that he met with us in August, and he talked about oatmeal throwing against the wall. And he said, all right, you educators, you know, I, threw, I threw this against the wall. What's going to stick in all the work that you do? What are your kids going to remember? So I'm thinking, using that theme, I'd like to contact as many students as I had when I was in a classroom, or as many students as I had when I was a principal, and talk to them, what do you remember about your elementary education? What sticks like oatmeal on a wall? And then maybe that would inform teachers that are in the field now to say, this is the things I would pursue. So I have gotten a couple answers from past students which should intrigue me, so thank you. Okay, how oh, far? Would you introduce family members What's that? Would you introduce family members that are here? Oh, family members that are here, sure. Barb Dolan, a high school friend, student of St. Joseph Elementary School and St. Edward's <laughs> High School. <laughs> Good friend since high school. All right, those of us that are part of the family, please stand. And I can point them out. Okay, Barb. This is my, Deanna introduced herself. That's her sister, Wendy. They're on my mother's side of the family. We've got here. Uh, back here, Angela and Bob Allenson. These are Bob's my first cousin. His mom was Lillian, my dad's sister. Next to him is Lanny Allenson. She was uh, she's a first cousin as well on my dad's side. Do I have everybody in here? Carrie's right there. Yeah, Carrie Karen. and Linda are back there. They're here. They're back there. Oh, who's back there? Oh, Larry. and Bay back there, Barb. I see my niece Kelly. Both niece Kellys. I see my yeah. sister in law Pat. Yeah. I see. Did I miss anybody? Oh, Larry, Larry Lebanon, my, my Kelly's husband. Leon. So there's a few, there's a few right there. Yeah, there's a few of us. My brother Barrett, like I said, he, he really wanted to be here, and I would have loved to have him here, but he, he can't. Oh, did I say nothing? I thought about Leon. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I have mentioned Leon. He's a, actually, Leon's been back to the last five minutes going. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, my husband Leon is there, and he's, the book's dedicated to him, and you're reading the acknowledgments about him, too. Go ahead, cousins, sit down. Anybody else that I missed? 
So we come from a big, big, big clan. My dad had uh, 41 first cousins. So, um, and on my mom's side, mom had, uh, they were from the Soralo family, and they, during the Elgin High years of the 1930s, there were seven Soralo, all female cousins, the Soralo girls. And so they have gone and, and spread, spread around the country now. But all part of Elgin history. And my grandfather's here with me right now because I'm wearing his watch. He, he owned a restaurant across from the Elgin Watch Factory and used to feed the people breakfast. They come to the restaurant for breakfast and, and lunch. And my mom and her sisters lived upstairs from the restaurant, right, right where the riverboat is now. So mom loved to play cards. She would have. <laughs> so, so, well, thank you all for being here. Thanks so much. I have one other presentation, and I forget to share this. It's explaining the book. During World War II, there's a little bit of history in the book, and in World War II, families had ration books. My parents saved those, and, and the upstairs family and the downstairs family all had their own ration books. So during that time, and inside there's stamps in here, and there's a, a book for each member of the family. You know, why do we save this stuff? I don't know. But it's been a treasure to know that that's how they experienced World War II, and the families had to bond together to make the most out of the goods they had in their house, in the two families. So. Uh, it's a little bit of history here. Thanks. All right, Alan. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin. One more round of applause. <laughs> Forgive me for not introducing myself last time I was here. My name is Al Walters, and for three more days, I'm the president of the museum. <laughs> and uh, there'll be a new president here next time. Now, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we could give tours to the museum if you're interested. Uh, Rebecca is here, and, and, and um, Rita. Rita Rita Shaw is here. We'll do it. You're welcome to look around on your own. Uh, we're so glad you're here today. Thank you for coming. And another option for your book acquisition, if you didn't get one today, is Kevin is going to set the museum up with some copies, and it'll be in our, our bookstore. So... So, so that's another option. Thanks y'all for coming. Thank you.